Welcome. My name is Natasha Sherman and I am your host. And my guest today is Kwame Ajamu, who spent 29 years in prison, some of them on death row, wrongfully convicted. He is part of an organization called Witness to Innocence, which is the only national organization in the United States composed and led by exonerated death row survivors and their family members. So I want to get right to your story. Welcome, Kwame. Hi. It's nice to be here. I, it's so great for me to be here, and it's unfathomable for me to even start to imagine your story. So maybe you could tell us the, the beginning, the story. How did you end up in prison? Well, initially, it was like 42 years now. Uh, the year was 1975. I was just 17 years old. My brother was 20, and my good friend, Ricky Jackson, was 18. We were uh, falsely accused of having robbed and killed a neighborhood store um, money order salesman and thus uh, sentenced to die in the electric chair. All of this happened before my 18th birthday. Um, my birthday is in October. I was tried and convicted and sentenced to die in September of that same year. So I'm going to and stop you right here because so we know that you were innocent. You were falsely con con um, accused mm -hmm. and sentenced. Here you are, 18 years old. I mean, and, and you're told they're going to put you to death. How do you deal with that? It was uh, and still is uh, a very traumatizing ordeal. Um, there's no imaginable explanation as to how I was able to go forward other than say as it's cliche but for the grace of God. Um, I have, I have uh, endured every type of mental and psychological uh, tormentation that uh, you can think of uh, from cursing uh, the day I was born, uh, God Almighty himself, and then again coming back to the stark realization that as a human being I had to reach and pick myself up and keep going because in this time, on this planet and, and where I'm at, the only thing that could help me is the legalities of the situation, not prayers, not friendship, nothing but a lawyer and a good, good decision in my favor. Wow. So let's go back to, so you, you were accused of committing a crime. Uh, you were innocent. I think all of you had alibis, yes? Mm-hmm. Ironclad, yes. And that didn't make a difference. No. There was no evidence against you except, uh, from what I understand, a 15-year-old was kind of coerced into pointing the finger at you and coerced into was, Yes, ma'am. He was 12, actually. And, uh, neighbor, yeah, neighborhood kid. Uh, he was a paper boy. Uh, his older sister uh, and I were in the same classroom. His oldest sister and my brother... Uh, attended uh, John Hay High School together. Uh, they were graduates of that school. And, uh, and so his name was Edward Vernon. He is Edward Vernon. He's still alive. And uh, what actually happened was he was just a kid that didn't get no attention in the neighborhood. Uh, he was skinny, hot bottle glasses, guys just to thump him in the head. You know the type. And so when this happened, he and, an, and a few other little boys were guesstimating what might have happened and who might have done it. And he popped off to the cops. Hey, I know who did it. And when they said who, he named myself, my brother, and my good friend. Um, the upshot of this was that um, he told his mom about it. And she told him, said, well, Edward, is that true? And he said, no. You know, he said, I was just talking. And so she said, well, you need to go back and straighten that out. And so they took them. I wasn't included because I was a juvenile and thus separated from my brother and my friend. But they took Edward to the county jail where they were at to identify them in a lineup, to which it failed. He didn't do it. And at that point, there is where the coercion started. The cops took him in the room, and uh, what the public would think was simple coercion, actually, it was very traumatizing to a 12-year-old kid because what, and I'm going to shock you here, his mother was dying of ovarian cancer at that time. We didn't know it, but the cops did. The authorities knew this, and thus they told that kid that since you're so young to go to prison, if you don't um, adhere to what we're saying in this criminal case against these three boys, we will lock your mother up. 
And I mean, let's face it, his mom was dying from ovarian cancer. You know, we were three strong kids that could grow old. And so he chose his mother. Yeah, and you know, even if they didn't threaten his mother, a 12-year-old to resist that kind of coercion, it's really tough. Exactly. They were so malicious. Um, he was actually separated from his parents and his family during the uh, course of the three trials that they had because we had separate trials. And they held him away from uh, his parents as far away from Cleveland, Ohio as New Jersey. You know, I'm going to interrupt you here and then I want to ask another question. You know, when you tell me this story, I think these people should be in jail is quite <laughs> where, the way I see it. But um, so now uh, you're sentenced to death row and you know you have a death sentence. Exactly. And <coughs> how long did you spend on death row? Three years. So there you are day after day thinking that they're going to put you to death. And from what I understood from an interview that I watched back then, death row was even worse than it is now. Oh, yes. So oh, yes. you're day in, day out, you're incarcerated in a small cell, knowing that one day they're heading toward that cell to put you to death. And you know that you're innocent. Right. This was... Um well, obviously the worst is the time of my life. Um, I, I can't um, put into words how dramatic this was. Um, I, we played, for instance, we played chess because we couldn't be face to face, so we would use the numerical system. And as you know, the chessboard has got 64 squares. So every square would represent 1 through 64. Well, the cells on death row, Oh, also number. And at some point during the course of a game, a, a man would move uh, to, say, for instance, Bishop 47. And on this particular day that I'm talking about, <coughs> that's exactly what happened. Uh, a guy moved his bishop to uh, 47, but it just happened to be this older man's cell who was suffering in his cell uh, from detection and a feeling of just total loss. And when he said 47, he misconstrued a chess game and he thought that it was actually the authorities coming to get him to execute him and for the next hour or so he just was blood girting screams that uh, are so penetrating to to your ears and yet your you can feel it on your skin and uh, these were occasions that happened more than not and so at a, as a kid I you know my 18th birthday was celebrated on a death row Thank you. I think, you know, even now, most of us kind of take it for granted that the legal system is pretty legit. Yeah. And, uh, and then you hear this story, and this story happens more than we care to admit. Yes, it does. And... Uh, it's unfathomable. It's hard for any of us to imagine. So I'm going to jump into, so after four years, they, uh, the Supreme Court of Ohio, I guess, turned, uh, said that uh, the death penalty was no longer allowed. Is that correct? Uh, in August of 1978, the Ohio Supreme Court ruled on the constitutionality of the death penalty. And thus, we were exonerated at that level from the death penalty. So you were moved uh, into general population unto, yes, for to life. Yes, to life sentences, yes. Yeah. Um, at that particular time, I was just in my first stages of 20s, like 20 and 1, and the average man in Ohio State Penitentiary was 33 and a half years. So I was way out of place in this general population where you know, they, the kids made too much noise, so they didn't like us. You know, we wanted to play music, so they didn't like us. You know, it's just everything that younger guys did, they didn't like us. So we became, again, victimized by the circumstances of having been victimized in the bowels of a society that was already stripped of any type of, of good, decent uh, uh, decor. And so here I was there. But um, being that I have uh, some 
absolute in my abilities and my willingness to survive, uh, I, I decided to go to school and utilize the educational system to my behest as opposed to just doing time and saying, hey, man, you know, I'm not guilty, but what can I do? So the educational circuit would empower me to realize and utilize the abilities to reach out into the world, which is what I did. And uh, for the next 21 years, I would be the administrative clerk throughout the educational system in the prison. And uh, thousands of men have gotten uh, GEDs, ABEs, uh, bachelor's, as far as bachelor's degrees on my watch based on the fact that I got into that educational system uh, as someone who was there but who was not a part of what was going on in that particular environment of which I was raised from a child. Okay? Wow, wow. So I'm going to jump because I want to get the full story. I mean, bravo for you that because you could have made the choice to just say, hey, exactly. whatever, uh, you know, what's the point? And yet something in you saw the point. Yes. So let's fast forward to how you ultimately got exonerated. And was your brother and your friend, were they in the same prison as you? Yes. Uh, this uh, happened um, for maybe two years after the... Uh, uh, exoneration from the death penalty. Right. Uh, sadly, my brother uh, would not be let go at that particular time. The reason being is that he had successfully gotten a new trial in 1977, but only to be resentenced the exact same way. Uh, they gave him uh, the exact same death penalty sentence and everything, and and thus resentence him resentence him back to the same cell. Once we got uh, released from the death penalty, uh, his case was like on the bottom of the new list. Sure. And thus he had to wait a whole year, which crushed my, my heart having to leave my brother on death row. Oh, my God. Now, the yeah. question is, how did you finally get out? So what happened with me was that I had uh, all of these accolades from education and helping so many people that in uh, 2002, I had uh, migrated to another institution close to here to Cleveland, Ohio, which was in Richmond, in Mansfield. And in 2002, myself and four other uh, prisoners uh, actually formed the um, inmate um, NAACP um, organization in prison, yeah. the first ever of its kind. And, and that like just pushed me over the top uh, eight months later, I saw the parole uh, uh, board, and instead of giving me a, a continuance, they gave me a parole, based on all of these accolades of just from the education, because wow. that was all I had. Wow. And uh, wow. So wait a minute. Once, I want to I stop you here. What yeah. did that feel like? when they It said was unbelievable. It was, uh, at that time... Uh, all of my immediate uh, elders, uh, save my brother, had passed away. Um, my mother, sister, aunties, uh, you know. And so uh, it was it was bittersweet. You know, I didn't want to stay. You know, I wanted to run to from there. Your, but you had to leave your brother. But I, again, I had, had to leave. Yeah, my brother and my dear friend. So I'm going to interrupt here. I have a million questions I'd like to ask, but one of them is. So, uh, ultimately, you were exonerated. The, the young man who had testified against you or who had been coerced to testify against you came forward mm -hmm. and you were exonerated. Did the state give you any money, any, anything that, to make amends? They, yes, they uh, compensated the three of us. Uh, at the tone of 51 grand a year and uh, on the state level. And uh, we are now uh, currently in the federal uh, level with the 1983 um, Well, thank lawsuit. God for something. But I, and so, but, you know, actually, um, and, and I say a lot of times, I do a lot of speaking around the country, and, and I say a lot of times that uh, if, they, if they were to exonerate all of the free uh, and free all of the innocent people uh, 
they could have my portion. Yeah. Wow. Of the finances. Wow. You see? So I, I guess my next biggest question is, so you come out of an institution that raised you. Uh, but at the same time, simultaneously, you raised yourself. You chose yes. a path that, you know, raised yourself in a very powerful and productive way. So you come out into society and you have to learn. It's like landing on another planet, I'm sure. And you have to learn all yes. kinds of new things. I guess my question is, how do you deal with being free? This is um, possibly the greatest experience uh, save being able to wake up not in prison. Uh, however, um, I uh, was so fortunate and, and I, I, I'm even writing about the fortune that uh, has bestowed me since being wronged. I was so fortunate that uh, just 90 days after being released, I met uh, the woman who would become my wife a year later and uh, she she is my everything. I mean, purely my everything. I, I, wow. I, I get teary. I get kind of emotional talking about this particular, you know, because that is the answer to your question. I was so, uh, uh, how can you say, um, uh, materialistically and uh, futuristically bankrupt in, in my abilities to to go to and forth and that so when when this woman came into my life it it, it changed everything changed for the better and uh I, there's never been you know when i met her i was trying to get on the bus and i didn't know that you had to put a, a green dollar bill in the thing i didn't know that you know and so just stuff like that you know and uh so we've been married i've been i got home in 2003 and we were married in 2004 and it's the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. Wow. Yes. I'm so thrilled and delighted to hear that. Did you find it, yeah. you know, so you live in an institution and there's a routine. And did you find it difficult to not have that routine? To kind of look over your shoulder and wait for somebody to tell you what to do? Yes. And um, what I did, again, was... Uh, psychologically and uh, educationally elevate myself from uh, those parameters as to where it really didn't bother me you know when they when they called count or just turn the television off in the middle of a program you know I had uh, I actually put my mind so far away from that type of conditioning uh, but this would be will come years later yeah. uh, the first and, and, yeah. and foremost part I had to learn myself as well as how to deal with uh, a prison with so many uh, vulgar, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, individuals uh, you know, eating and sleeping beside me, you know, breathing and living in my space, you know, or should I say me in their space because I was truly the one who was out of place. Yeah. And so um, the, the fact that you can learn something different is so true. Uh, especially to my uh, uh, situation because I actually taught myself how to, as you say, fake it to make it with that entire situation. You know, uh, those guys didn't know me. I didn't know them. I didn't want to know them. I didn't want to be a part of them. But because I was who I was and that the element of my human camaraderie was a bit above us, it wasn't, hadn't been spoiled. And I, I refused to let it be soured by them, uh, I did have the compassion and uh, the presence of mind to enter into that school situation and, and help those guys. Wow. Uh, Extraordinary. And, and, you know. I'm not sure exactly, uh, my clock isn't running, and I'm not sure exactly how much time I have left, but I want to ask a couple more questions. Um, the uh, Your brother spent how many more years before you could get him out? Great. So after I made the, the parole in 2003, uh, my brother had actually made a parole in 2002. It's a mind boggling story. And uh, those of us who are listening and who didn't experience it can only live it through our imagination. And even then, I'm sure we can't imagine it fully. Um, 
but here you are like it's extraordinary it's miraculous that after all those years in prison and innocent it would be easy to come out and just want to be vengeful and vindictive and negative and um you know again do the opposite of what you're doing but now you're committed to abolishing the death penalty that i will do until the day i die yes um I am a soldier. I am an abolitionist. I am one who is those to the call. I am here now on your program simply because I get the chance to say that I am all of these things. You see? Yeah. I am and, one who yeah. fights. You know, uh, again, I'm going to ask you in a minute what you want from the world at large, what they you want them to be aware of. But it's interesting. You know, I had this conversation knowing I was going to do this show with someone who said that um, they did, they kind of saw the need for the death penalty with it. How do you actually say it's okay to kill somebody? Uh, mm. And I could see the desire to do it, but not doing it. And, um, and for me, it's if there is the chance that even one innocent human being is put to death, then you can't have a death penalty. Because exactly. by the same token that you're putting them to death and they're innocent, then the people who put him to death should be put to death. The system that sends him, you know, they've done, they've killed an innocent person. So exactly. it just doesn't make sense. So we've got about four or five minutes left. Tell me what you most want people to know. If I could, if I could have any influence, Yes. Uh, the world over. It, it obviously would be to eliminate uh, capital punishment. The death penalty is wrong for a litany, a great litany of reasons. Uh, so much so that uh, just to give you a broad ideal of what I mean, um, here in Ohio, they, they are executed in, guilty people, not innocent, but guilty people in such a harsh, barbaric way that uh, if you were to look at, say, for instance, uh, Dennis McGuire's case, uh, 27 minutes, the man actually asked if they would give him something to take orally instead of what they were doing in his arm with this three-drug cocktail that they only tried on Dennis at the particular time. Or, uh, for instance, Joe Clark, another Ohioan who uh, was a drug intravenous user and um, guilty, of course, but the barbaric and the harsh way in which capital punishment works, um, they actually blew his arm up. I mean, really. It diminishes us as a species. It really as diminishes a species, us. Yes. We go from being this great epitome of a mold to just scum, just the, the scug of the earth. And the people that follow us in doing this barbaric um, thing, China. I mean, really, China, Saudi Arabia. Right. Look but, at but, the people but, and the practices of these folks and see that even with them, the barbaricness of the capital punishment is way too much for human beings. We yeah. never should hurt each other intentionally. Yes, never. yes, I agree. So uh, in terms of uh, you go around speaking, and, I do. And again, you're asking people to do what they can in their state or with the federal Write government. Write your congressman. Yes. Go down to the lobby and let's get some letters. Stand with me, if you will, and help me practice the good practice of fighting against the capital punishment. Yeah. Awesome. And oh, in one minute left, you said you're uh, having this peace project or peace event. What is that? Yes. I, uh, and this is, um, the, you know, just from my humble opinion and my eyesight, the world is so screwed up that I have uh, actually um, started a venture to have come into the community, all of the religious sects, uh, the Christians, the Muslims, the Jews, uh, the, uh, the man on the street that's protesting, the lady in the alley that's got the problem with child welfare, everybody, the administration, uh, meaning the mayor, uh, the captains and the, the police, if they would come. Uh, everyone who has something to do with bringing this community together and come in a peaceful fashion, once and for all, 
and let's let get God in this for a change. Let's see what God can do in our hearts and if it manifests in our spiritual beings yeah. on earth. Kwame, we're at the end of our show. I'm so thrilled we could do this. I'm just kind of blown away by what it took for you to come out of prison and be the human being that you are now. So thank you for the work that you did. Uh, the, your playground wasn't much of a playground and your <laughs> yeah. educational system wasn't uh, one you would have chosen, but you are a formidable force in the world and I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. My name is Natasha Sherman. Thank you for joining us.